China's kind of buying up a little bit of everything right now, in the States at least. If they're not the primary owner, they're the biggest silent partner (laughs) in everything that you know and love. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So uh, with a short introduction, let's introduce uh, Sam Wei. Sam Wei, actually, we have a history. Uh, We actually worked at Spark Unlimited together uh, on Lost Planet 3. He was an environment artist. He was an environment artist, and that's a whole different podcast that we did, right? He he, he went from an artist to full-on t- designer mm-hmm. and uh, went on to work at Giant Squid, went over to China to work at a, a VR company, and yeah. now he has his own company, Cole Interactive. In- impressive trajectory is what I could say. It just I, makes I, me feel I, lazy. Like, I remember dude. the day, like, Sam was like, you know, I want to do some design. Like, give me some design, Rodney. So Rodney's like, all right, you can do this. Sam's like, cool. And then the next job, I'm a designer. And, like, he's doing design games yeah, now. Yeah. And then he's like, cool. And then he's like, you know what? I'm a creative director now. And he, I'm doing creative direction. And he's like, cool. You know what? I've learned it. I got this. <laughs> Sam started his own damn company. I'm so proud of you, Sam. Yeah. Shout out all the way from America, man. Like, it couldn't have happened to a better person. And obviously, we wish you and everyone at Cole Interactive the absolute best. Small things mm-hmm. of high value. Yeah. I think that's the tagline. That's the tagline. Okay. Well, that's when Sam was doing all that, I was putting together this nice little uh, Photoshop screen right here. But uh, Sam, Sam's out here running companies, and we're doing Photoshop. yeah, yeah. Sam, I'm gonna pipe him in real all right, quick. Let's do this. All right, uh, let me transfer him over. Same way. How you doing, Sam? Yo. Hey. Good. What's up, How dude? are you guys? Long time no see, brother. Good. Yeah. How was uh? The internet speed. It's going okay? You, your audio is coming in great. Okay? So that at least, okay. you know what I mean? Like, that's the bare minimum. Okay. We understand. It's China cool. to oh. USA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. not on the Elon Musk cool, man. satellites yet. So once that becomes available in our area, we'll, we'll work this right out. All right, All right Sam. Thanks so much I've... for the, the generous introduction. Of course, dude. Well, let me ask you this. Was any of it a lie? <laughs> uh, nope. Nope, so nope. why are you doing all right? This? <laughs> That's all you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you. Yeah. Thanks, there. Yeah, of course, man. Cool. Right, man. So uh, as you are uh, uh, pulling up your slides, uh, we'll go ahead and yeah. get started. And uh, this all is right. a talk that I'm very look, much uh, looking forward to. Obviously, um, I have no idea what's going on in China, yeah. but I just know they own like everything over here. We're talking away all the way from uh, right. Basically, Tencent, yep. and then all the other companies. Sure. <laughs> all right, so uh, Sam, right, this is the mic. To... Mic is yours. Yep. Cool. Is uh, my uh, PowerPoint showing up okay? Like, yep. Everything... yep. Here's to okay, prove it, man. Cool. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, my my uh, talk is a little bit more scripted uh, than. Uh, uh, Cecil's like my, I have a lot to go over. It's like China's a big country. Uh, so, uh, here we go. Um, so my talk is called, uh, understanding game dev in China and LA game devs insights into culture, game dev and VR in China. So I've been a character modeler, environment artist, level designer, game designer, and creative director. Uh, I was a character modeler for two years at Nickelodeon Animation Studio on shows like the Kung Fu Panda TV series. I've contributed as a designer to games like Friday the 13th, Abzu, Star Citizen, and Lost Planet 3. Uh, I started transitioning professionally into VR and AR about three years ago. Uh, Since then, I've done design work on Jurassic World VR Expedition and Follow Me Dragon, an AR app for iOS. Uh, A year ago, I moved to Beijing, where I've been a creative director at a VR studio called Sandman Studios. Uh, While I was there, I directed a cute horror story about baby carrots being eaten uh, called Fresh Out, which premiered at Venice Film Festival. I've recently started my own studio, and I'm currently working on a slow-motion AR shooter game called Bullet Time AR for iOS and Android. So as I prepared for this talk, I realized I had more and more to say. Uh, While I still don't claim to be an expert on China, China is huge and diverse, and I've only been here a year, uh, not not quite a year and a half. Uh, Sometimes I feel like Bill Murray in Lost in Translation, except I'm in China. With that said, uh, being dropped into the deep end of such a dramatically different culture provides some unquestionable truths confirmed by research, my firsthand experience, and the experiences of others I've talked to. 
Uh, I'm going to start more generally talking about my experience here and then talk about work culture across industries in China. Uh, from there, I'll get into specifics about the state of game dev here, including the talent pool, clones, censorship, publishing, and the indie scene. Uh, finally, I'm going to go over the Chinese government's support of VR and challenges specific to VR content development in China. I hope you come away from my talk with some insights into culture, the game industry, and VR in China. Uh, as China's impact on the world continues to grow, I hope these insights uh, can inform how you work or do business here, even if tangentially. Uh, so first, let me go over some typical things people ask me about my experience here. I've lived here uh, in Beijing about a year and four months. I moved here because my wife tricked me into it. Uh, but also that she wanted to be closer to her parents and wanted to see how uh, China was developing. And, and she's from Beijing originally. Uh, and for, for me, I was down for the adventure and I felt like I needed a change of scenery after mostly being in LA since 2006. Uh, just hang tight guys, we'll get him right back as soon as we can. Yeah, I think he's just dipping in and out. So, we'll hear his voice. All right, All right, we got him back. Oh, okay. Uh, Here you go. Yep. Can you pick okay. up from uh, why I moved to China? Okay, cool. Um, so uh, I moved to China because my wife tricked me into it, but also she's originally from Beijing uh, and she wanted to be close to her parents and wanted to see how China was developing. And for me, uh, I was down for the adventure and felt like I needed a change of scenery after mostly being in LA since 2006. Um, so I was born in Chicago and my parents are from Taiwan. So I grew up speaking Mandarin with them, but I really didn't realize how limited my vocabulary was until I moved here. Um, so what's awesome here? The food is awesome here. Uh, you don't realize how diverse Chinese cuisine is and in such an enormous country until you live here. Uh, every, every province has its own specialty. Uh, also, sightseeing is amazing. Uh, there's so much history here and there's so much to learn about the culture. Uh, each region has its own customs and characteristics and there's also a definite sense of dynamism and opportunity here. Uh, things change so fast and there's just a sense that there's so much room for growth uh, because the size of the market. Um, as, and as Western developers, there's also a great sense of opportunity here uh, because we're of high value coming from a generally more mature and experienced market. Uh, but what sucks here, uh, pollution is extreme and intolerable in China, uh, depending on the day. The, the summer has many more clear days and in the winter on the worst days, you can't even see across the street because the pollution is so bad. Uh, another thing that sucks You say uh, China, you say suck, they start. Uh, yeah, I turned the microphone off. <laughs> hey, Sam, welcome back. What's up? Uh, hey, the, hey, I think hey. the last main um, part we had was uh, pollution is so dark, you can't barely see across the street on some days. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thanks for. Okay. Cool. Um, so, yeah, pollution is terrible. Um, another thing that sucks is as a Westerner uh, tied into the Western eco internet ecosystem, uh, moving to China and being behind the Great Firewall has been really excruciating. Uh, you, can, you can get around it with VPN, but it adds so much friction to your daily life to be constantly turning on and off VPN every time you want to use Google, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, whatever, Reddit. Um, so uh, some, some cultural differences can be really challenging too. Uh, frustrating everything, everyday things here like squat toilets, people cutting you off in line, rude service people, and more can really add up. But despite all these challenges, uh, I've really had a really epic year here, and I really owe it all to my wife, Ruby. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the most like pervasive aspect of uh, business culture here in particular. Um, so... Uh, one of the most pervasive aspects of doing business in China is the idea of guanxi or connections and relationships, which is central to how business is done in China. 
there's a great Forbes article which explains how this has deep rooted historical reasons in a society where business and societal relationships relied more heavily on networks of trust and mutual obligations than on strong codified laws. Depending on the industry and region, the concept of guanxi can make or break you. I personally saw situations where navigating cumbersome bureaucracies were dramatically smoothed over and rules were bent by people having deep rooted connections. In another example, specific to the game industry, I heard rumors that Capcom's Monster Hunter World, published by Tencent, was banned because their competitor, NetEase, had a better relationship with government censors. It's just a rumor, but if it's true, it's an example of how lacking Guanxi can cost you millions of dollars. As a Westerner, if you don't have Guanxi in China, it's easy to fall into unreliable business relationships because it's these pre-existing relationships which tend to hold parties accountable rather than contracts or laws. Especially in new business relationships, Chinese businesses tend to put up a good front in presenting themselves as having a strong track record only to fail to live up to expectations. It's important then to meticulously verify and continuously hold other parties accountable. For example, if you're meeting with a Chinese art, art outsourcer, meet and speak with the specific artist who will be creating content for you. If you're interviewing for a job, make sure you meet the team that you'll be working with. One Chinese developer I chatted with said, there's an art to honoring the letter of an agreement, but not the spirit of it. In the absence of Guanxi, it's important to find a Sherpa or a guide who does have Guanxi and start building your own network from there. In Beijing, I've only just begun to build this network for myself. Uh, I've been told it's really hard to ever be considered in the in crowd as a Westerner here. For this reason, in various industries, I see groups of expats banding together and supporting each other, which provides a great sense of community. The lack of a rules-based society and reliance on relationships sounds really bad. But the flip side of this is that it creates an enormous sense of dynamism if you do have the right connections. It can dramatically compound your ability to navigate bureaucracies, bend rules, and get things done. This situation can also open up incredible opportunities if, unlike your talkative competitors, you can actually do what you say you can do. Uh, suddenly, you become a very big fish in a small pond of hustlers in the biggest consumer market in the world. Again, again, the degree to which all of this is true can vary depending on in industries, regions, and the companies, and, and companies. But these are my broad conclusions. Uh, now, I'd like to talk about my impressions specific to the game dev scene here. Uh, it's well established that China has the largest games market in the world, and the development scene here is much more skewed toward mobile and PC. This infographic from 2016 shows. Uh, consoles at only 2% of the market since China had only legalized the sale of consoles the year before in 2015. Culturally then, people of my generation in China didn't necessarily grow up on the console games that were cultural touchstones for our generation in the West, and instead got into gaming culture through PC games. The talent pool and companies still tend to use Unity Engine because of the dominance of the mobile market. But Unreal Engine, which is my engine of choice, is gaining traction. Uh, game development tends to be located around tech hubs like Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Beijing. Hangzhou is also growing. The universities and trade schools produce programmers, artists, and animators. However, there's a complete lack of game design curriculums. This exasperates the problem of a lack of designers and rampant cloning in games in China. Devs I've talked to bemoan the lack of creativity in the game industry here and blame the blame it on an oppressive school system where students don't have time for individual pursuits. This lack of creativity leads us to the topic of cloning and the climate of games publishing in China. When I recently asked a games marketing guy about worries of cloning in China, he flat out said, you will get cloned. Some notable examples of major games getting cloned are Tencent making Caliber of Spirit, which is a clone of League of Legends, which is by a company that they own, right, games. I heard this didn't go over so well. Another one is NetEase uh, cloning Friday the 13th as a game called Identity 5 for mobile. He went on to explain to me how China isn't a place for innovation in games. Games publishers are focused on profitability and reducing risk. So they only want to know what successful game you're copying and how you're going to make it slightly better. 
These large companies like Tencent and NetEase also seem to soak up all the good game development talent by being able to outbid small studios on top talent and then either squeezing them out or buying them out. All this hurts innovation when this top talent is used to merely clone other games. The indie dev scene here in China does produce some gems though. Uh, the screenshot on the right is of an interesting game called Chinese Parents, which provides some social commentary about being a Chinese parent who pushes their child to succeed, but not so hard that they kill themselves. Games like these are released on Steam, which is a legal gray area where Chinese censors are not regulating and it's not blocked by the Great Firewall. However, this method of releasing games abroad to avoid censorship may, avoid, may uh, end soon. Uh, Valve is currently working with the Chinese company Perfect World to create a version of Steam specifically for the Chinese market. Uh, when, when this is released, it's assumed that regular Steam may get blocked in China. Uh, censorship is another huge topic in, in China. The censorship of games was recently consolidated from two government agencies into one, now called the State Administration of Press and Publication. In 2017, game approvals were halted for eight months due to this restructuring, uh, which caused huge problems for publishers. Uh, publishers are required to get a publishing license from the SAPP, which can be denied if they deem that the game contains inappropriate elements. These restrictions recently became more strict and now ban blood of any color, corpses, skeletons, skulls, and anything that portrays China in a negative light. They're also limit starting to limit the the number of uh, cheap and obvious clones and the overall number of poker and mahjong games released. Foreign owned companies can't release games in China, so they frequently partner with local companies who will publish for them and navigate the approval process. It's also interesting to note that there's a secondary black market for publishing licenses. As with anything in China, certain companies have a better guanxi with sensors and are able to obtain a publishing license for games of a certain genre early. Uh, they will sometimes sell this publishing license at a high cost to third parties, but the game they release will roughly need to be in the same genre that the publishing license was originally for. On the right is a classic example how they, of how they changed World of Warcraft to appease censors. Uh, and the following video is of how they changed uh, PUBG recently. Uh, instead of dying, uh, your downed enemies wave to you and give you a loot box. I think this is pretty hilarious, and I'm sort of looking forward to the ridiculous ways developers uh, will work around these restrictions. Uh, are you guys? Uh, I can't. I can't tell if uh, you guys are streaming the thing. So yeah, if you click the play button, okay. we should be able to see it. I can see your mouse. Okay, so, I can so, see it hovering. Okay, I'll just. I'll just okay. Okay, okay, I'll just play it myself. Cool. Okay, yep. I'm assuming this is. Wait. No. What's up, Larry? Sorry. Um, that's a YouTube link? Uh, yeah, but it's like. Really low quality because I totally ripped okay. it from Twitter. Oh, okay. I was going to say we might be able to play it ourselves, but I, it might be best to describe it for right. the sake of time. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's it's just a video of uh, a, a, in PUBG where uh, the guy a guy gets downed, and when the guy finishes him off, uh, the guy gets back up and waves at him and gives him a box. And it's uh, kind of ridiculous. It's All one right, of my so, favorite videos. Uh, from here, yeah, it's my mine too. I love it. <laughs> um, so from here, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, VR development in China, which is what I've been doing. Um, so there's a huge amount of government support in VR and AR in China. Uh, the Chinese government sees it as an important part of their global competitiveness in technology. It was a big component in their central government's recent five-year plan, which was surprisingly detailed. It sets out high-level goals for supporting the entire ecosystem from very specific software and hardware objectives to methods of promoting adoption across industries. 
By setting these high-level goals, it'll be up to the local provincial governments to do their best to execute on them. Another example of government support was Jiangxi province announcing 460 million in XR investment, as well as Guizhou government building their $1.5 billion theme park and development complex. These provinces see these investments as ways to modernize and develop their economies. Um, the numbers are mind blowing, right? But as a developer, it's a, it's a uh, decision to be made whether the trade-off of free rent and possibly substantial investment is worth the lack of access to talent and quality of life you'd get in China's tech hub cities. I personally took a tour of one of these giant development campuses in Qingdao that was geared more toward Just a moment, folks. He'll be right back. Yeah. Once we hear his voice, we'll switch back. <laughs> but a lot, a lot of the things that he's talking about is, uh, it's kind of scary, <laughs> especially the part which I never thought about because we're, we're very familiar with Chinese uh, developers s s stealing and copying sure. American games and it gets going with it. I mean, that's pretty much their business model. And there's taught. Go ahead, Sam. Sorry, we, we had to cut out, but we, uh, yeah. uh, if you can just start back like uh, about two, three minutes. So you were, I think you were somewhere around the huge amount of government support for VR, AR and the 400. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so examples of huge amounts of government support uh, is Jiangxi province announcing 460 million in XR investment as well as Guizhou government uh, building their $1.5 billion theme park and development complex. So these provinces see these investments as ways of modernizing and developing their economies. Uh, the numbers are mind blowing, right? But as a developer, it's a decision to be made whether the trade-off of free rent and possibly substantial investment is worth the lack of access to talent and the quality of life you'd get in China's bigger tech hub cities. I personally took a tour of one of these giant tech uh, development campuses in Qingdao uh, that was more geared toward movie making. And it was kind of a creepy ghost town, although the facilities were amazing. A lot of startups may need this government backing to survive though, to survive though because the profitability isn't really there yet for VR. The one place where VR is profitable is in location-based entertainment, which is much more ubiquitous than in the West. It seems like every mall in China either has a VR arcade or kiosk, and there's tons of malls in China. They're like everywhere in China. Uh, however, this doesn't necessarily translate to profitability for us as game developers, since many of them simply use pirated software or let customers play games off of Steam, which aren't licensed for this kind of use. The investment in the custom game experiences mostly isn't worth it if no one's willing to pay licensing fees and there's no enforceability. So the market is both hungry for quality content, but also not willing to invest in it for lack of profitability, which is a big problem. Uh, big companies like Tencent and NetEase are beginning to dabble in VR though. And there's a few indie studios doing VR like the one I was at, Sandman Studios. Uh, so I recently left Sandman Studios to start my own company uh, called Cole Interactive. I paired the company name with a diamond logo because I like the idea that under pressure, we can create small things of immense value. I'm currently working on a visceral slow motion sh shooter for mobile AR called Bullet Time AR. It's definitely inspired by slow motion shooters like Super Hot and Max Payne mixed with melee mechanics from old FPS brawlers like Condemned. Uh, here's some older footage of uh, the initial prototype. <laughs> what I'm most excited about this is how well Oh, the potential. 
potential of AR, putting a game layer on top of the world. Yeah. All right. Man. So, um, I guess it looks like one of the people in Twitch was listening to me ask you what we could do to help you. And it's, I can barely read the name, Alter de Brees, it looks like, is suggesting mm -hmm. you apply for Global Top Round. Uh, GlobalTopRound.com. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to pass that on to you because if it oh. helps, then awesome. I haven't even heard of that. There you that's go. That's awesome. Awesome. That, that's another grant or something? Is, so, is, is that another grant or something? or? I have just as much information about it at this point as you do, so I assume so. Uh, they probably they might <laughs> drop another comment. Yes, yeah, sure, so people sure. are saying yep. Okay. Yeah, it's another cool. grant. Yeah. Cool. Thank That's you. Awesome. Man. I'll check it out. Thanks, guys. Awesome. The whole like live video with Twitch thing. Thank you. Like, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. This is dope. Yeah. Well, uh, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt, but continue on your presentation. <laughs> yeah. Everyone got to yeah. uh, see it if they didn't see the link. Yeah, it's mainly for the um, phone people who didn't want to close the Discord or the Twitch right. app. So. Uh, yeah. So that was uh, pretty much my presentation. If I, I'd love to get your feedback on my presentation. Uh, China is like a huge place, and I'm just starting to wrap my head around it. Um, if you guys like ha like have questions or if you disagree with the point, totally hit me up. Like uh, if you have other insights, like that'd be great to hear. Um, uh, also, uh, yeah, closing connections. Like uh, add me on Twitter uh, and Instagram. Um, my Instagram tends to be like Chinese food pics, uh, which is awesome if you're into that. Uh, but uh, if you're into game dev stuff, that's mostly my Twitter stuff. Um, and uh, I, I started an account for my my uh, Bullet Time AR project in particular. Nice. Um, and if you're interested in uh, uh, following the development, uh, it'd be awesome to if you got signed up for my mailing list, which I totally just set up uh, at bullettimear.com. Oh, um, and, uh, yeah, at, at some point, uh, I'll probably, uh, uh, open it up to like beta testing on like test flight on iOS or, mm -hmm. uh, early access on, uh, at the Google play store. Uh, so it'd be awesome to get help like testing on different devices eventually. Uh, but not quite ready yet for that, but, uh, it'd be awesome to have people on the mailing list to, uh, ask about that when it's time. Well, I'm quite positive. Uh, and that's get it. Some support. Yeah. You got at least Brandon yeah, and I. Yeah, thanks. So we want to play it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. I mean, thank look, you. Um, this is the Q&A part, right? Yeah. And this is a lot of questions that Larry okay. and I have about game development. Sure. We were, uh, as you were cutting okay. in and out during uh, the presentation, we were asking ourselves how scary of mm -hmm. the thought that we never really thought about. We were used to Chinese developers kind of cloning everything that we make in the United States. It's kind of like run of the mill. Mm -hmm. They do it with yeah. every other like industry. Right What's yeah. different about games? If your game is good or not. <laughs> but a Chinese right. developer, cloning right. a Chinese developer, uh, I, I, I imagine it's the wild, wild west, as, as you have mentioned before. Um, it is, frustrating oh my God, it is the wild be. west here. Yeah. 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 It's the wild west, man. That's, yeah. that, that's kind of scary, you know, like if you you put yeah. your heart and soul into something and you're excited about it you put it out there at least here i know that we have like legal right. recourse that we can take so there's damages right right i guess what's I right mean, you're right. a company owner there now i guess what would your strategy be it's like oh yeah right, our money's gone because we've now been cloned four times right yeah. right right honestly <laughs> like that honestly like right honestly that's why i've kind of been a little hesitant to approach big companies like Tencent and NetEase, right? Uh, because like they have like a, an enormous team, right? And if they were really interested in me in my project and I wasn't interested in working with them, they could clone me in like a week, right? Mm. With the size of their dev team, right? Yeah. Uh, so, um, 
definitely i'm a little cautious uh, like like it's the it's uh yeah it's, it's something to be to feel out right yeah so man so i guess the one strategy you could take is you make your whole game and then you just go look for a publishing partner with a complete product yeah because if they try to rip you off they automatically right. know that you have such a head start because yours is done but i mean who can who exactly can that exactly if you're making a big game yeah and the huge aspect you're right, so right, used right. to um living here in the states like your, your slides talking about mm -hmm. The reality check living in china sitting in squat toilets but i mean that is the way you should be <laughs> squatting all right they sell these porta potty right. not porta potties right. these step stools at costco the Body potties, laughing, man. but he knows what i'm talking about <laughs> those step stools that they sell at costco you're supposed to put your leg up right that is the way you should be doing the, your business yeah. poop yes commercial. well it's a step that anyways yeah, yeah. Well, i'm Body digressing potties, man but yeah, like, like imagine that imagine that potty. in china yes yeah. squatty potties exactly that and <laughs> in addition of so many things like has to affect you as a game developer <laughs> like just not yeah. well it's, yeah. it's a culture shock uh yeah. but on top of learning the business yeah. side of things and man like you mm -hmm. going through and creating your own studio what was the major decision you saw you must have seen despite of all these issues a lot of opportunity uh with game development over there uh in china as a u.s citizen sure. yeah sure. yeah um yeah so i what really pushed me in this direction was just like uh maybe some discontent with my day job right and wanting to really own something that was of a small manageable scope and like you, as game developers you know like how easy it is to uh over scope your project right we all want to make the coolest biggest thing we can right and so this was me like kind of going back to like create and focus on something small that i can achieve on my own if i need to yeah. uh, but also has like can scale up if i need to uh if i can right uh, and uh, FPSs are like a proven, well-worn path, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and there, but also it get, FPSs like are such a is such a flexible genre, also. Uh, and so I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, in terms of being in China, uh, this is also a way for me to like. Uh, uh keep myself busy well, my wife uh, just got a good job at a big uh pharmaceutical company so um this is also a way to keep myself busy and do something that i really own uh myself uh while i'm here while she explores her career stuff too you know congrats um, to your wife on the new job by the way yeah 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 she's uh kicking ass yeah. <laughs> it seemed like you were saying that there's like a clamoring for learning about game design in china uh, yeah. You being a certified yeah. game designer at this point in your career, is there any like, hey, you know what? Maybe I'll offer some like curriculum or offer a product that could help exactly. alleviate some of that because you bring like traditional Western right. style development over there. Right, right, right. So I've that's been a consideration, right? Like if my my uh, self funding runs out on this project, and uh, and I don't get. Uh, other pro external project funding uh then and i just need to pay the bills that's totally an option to like teach game development here um uh definitely like uh i know some people uh at like beida which is like the big university in beijing um that might be able to make some uh, open some doors for me but yeah. like for now, like my initial my my initial goal is to make something that like I own myself, you know. Gotcha. Um, so uh, that's definitely a consideration in the future. Oh yeah, man. All right, so uh, we'll just leave it off with one less question from the Twitch audience, YouTube audience, anyone that's watching. Just want to remind you that you can ask us questions. Uh, we have moderators over there uh, filling them. So this question from uh, Indie Develop, 
Question uh, is, how has developing AR VR content on mobile differed from creating for desktop and traditional game experiences? Controller. Um, the most obvious difference is, of course, like your performance limitations and memory perform memory limitations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're a lot stricter. Uh, in terms of inputs, like I mentioned, like how rich of an input device uh, iPhones are with like swipe gestures, and you can shake it, you can talk, you can use the mic and have voice inputs. Um, if with in AR, it becomes a six degree freedom controller, right? Where you can uh, it knows where the phone is spatially, and that you can use that for like uh, for me in my game, like your phone is basically what you're using to like dodge bullets right so like it's basically your your face your head you know um and uh basically what you'd use like a vr headset for motion tracking for what for you know um yeah cell phones are like so uh follow me dragon uh, which is free on the iOS store. You should check it out. Uh, <laughs> plug. Uh, oh, go for it. Uh, was the first. It was the first. Uh, was the first AR. Uh, and it was on my first mobile app that I worked on. Uh, and coming from AAA, um, it was a pretty interesting experience um, uh, because of these uh, different uh, input uh, affordances. And um, also, like, I think uh, as Unreal developers, uh, there's not that most Unreal most mobile development is on Unity, right? Uh, so, if you're an Unreal developer putting stuff out on mobile, uh, you can kind of uh, y your game already inherently has a different look to it than like ninety percent of games out there on mobile, right? Um, and, and definitely Unreal has different strengths. Uh, Un Unreal has, uh, uh, I think, I think looks better and, and uh, has uh, different uh, affordances, like uh, has nice uh, stock AI functionality, right? Uh, among other features that are fun to uh, leverage on mobile. Well, Sam, what's next for you, brother? Uh, not necessarily immediately, but more long term. Where do you want to see your company grow? Um, we will see, man. Like, I'm sure. gonna. What's next is like me keeping my head down and uh, trying to crank crank like a bare bones version of this game out, and uh, and then release it and see how it performs, get people's feedback, and if I can and if can afford to uh, iterate on it and um, kind of learn about, I think the, one of the big things I'm personally learning about is uh, mobile monetization, which is a completely different beast for us uh, coming from AAA, right? Um, it's like a different mindset it's a different it's a lot of different design philosophies um it's a lot to learn uh but it's exciting and it's uh it, it seems like um it, it well it's something that a big chunk of the market is it, it's the majority of the gaming market not actually like nowadays so it's uh worth it to understand this stuff you know well, Sam, we hope to come see you in person in China. You can, you know, walk us around and show us what's what. Uh, but for now, we have to say goodbye to your brother. <laughs> <laughs> so he locked up. He took off. it so literally. <laughs> <laughs> Peace.